Lord Lawson, thank you for joining me. Uh, you said recently that we don't have an energy bill as such. What did you mean by that? I think that that's clear. Even the strongest advocates admit that it is not about energy policy at all. It's entirely about decarbonisation. Uh, in order to meet the targets in the Climate Change Act and also to some extent the European Union targets, but particularly our own unilateral target, uh, carbon reduction targets in the uh, Climate Change Act, uh, this bill is meant to achieve the measures to achieve that. It is nothing to do with what energy policy was when I was Energy Secretary 30 odd years ago when energy policy, as I saw it, was how do you get the cheapest and most reliable supply of energy for British business and industry and households. That is what I call an energy policy. This is simply about how do you meet the decarbonisation targets. And it is the consequences for energy uh, policy and energy users are not good. Do you think that's where the fundamental problem lies, which is we have a policy that is asking one thing, and an actual need for something else, a need for businesses to have certainty, a need for investors to have certainty to invest in new infrastructure, and a need to keep costs down, and yet a target that kind of works against that. That's right. And instead, you talk of certainty. Uh, in business life, there is no such thing as certainty. Uh, and indeed, uh, businessmen, entrepreneurs and managers have to do the most sensible thing they can uh, in an uncertain world. Unfortunately, this bill increases, in my opinion, the uncertainty in, in, in one important way, as well as being not dedicated to having an efficient and cheap source of energy, but having uh, decarbonisation, which means going for wind power, which is hugely expensive and indeed to some extent nuclear power, but nuclear power is also uh, considerably more expensive than fossil fuel power. Anyhow, the uncertainty is this, that under this bill, the Secretary of State is given an unlimited right to sign contracts with whichever energy suppliers he, he wishes to favour and whatever uh, price, strike price as they call it, he decides to sign that and for a period of years. So there's individual negotiations. So, and, you know, Secretary of State for Energy Change and the, you know, the, the arbitrariness, arbitrariness of this, uh, which is subject to no parliamentary scrutiny, adds a further layer of uncertainty, in my opinion, to the uncertainties that are inevitable in business in the business world you don't know what's going to happen to the oil price you don't know what's going to happen to uh, oil production gas production we've just had this exciting uh, technological breakthrough uh, uh, which enables us to use develop through fracking the shale gas resources that the world has and the shale oil resources to a lesser extent, particularly the gas, it's important, but it's both. And we in the United Kingdom are particularly rich in these resources, it seems. This has changed the whole energy picture since the bill was framed, and yet the bill hasn't been changed in the slightest. But Ed Davey would argue that by signing the strike price, although it, it is extortion at the level, you know, double the market value, what he's done is he's given us certainty, because without it, EDF wouldn't have built these power stations. The EDF's success in taking the British government for a ride and negotiating this very long-term contract at this ludicrously high strike price is, um, gives EDF more certainty. It certainly does give EDF more certainty. But the fact that the Secretary of State has this arbitrary power to do these things, which, as I say, are building in higher prices for energy for this country than we need to have, uh, it creates all sorts of uncertainties for energy consumers. And any business and industry, as well as the households, it is the energy consumers who are the losers of the, in this. And I'm afraid what it is going to mean is the more and more uh, of energy intensive manufacturing processes are going to go overseas. We're going to lose out in a big way. Do you think Ed Miliband's salvo with freezing energy prices, it, whatever it's done, it has put energy right in the heart of the 2015 election, hasn't it? 
It has. It, it, it's uh, put. It has put a focus on energy, which I hope will lead to a reconsideration of some of these mistaken policies. So I am not altogether sorry that he's done this. Do you agree with John Major that, uh, al although perhaps the practicality is wrong, the sentiment is right, and the poor and those who can't afford uh, energy are being left behind in this you know, rush for new policy? I'm very fond of John. He used to be my number two when I was Chancellor of the Exchequer for a time. Uh, the, but the idea that somehow there's a windfall profit that the energy companies are making, I think that's most unlikely. Uh, first of all, it's a kind of oligopoly. There's only a few, and what oligopolies always do is they keep the profit margin low, so as not to encourage new entrants. So it is highly unlikely that their profits are very high. The only windfall profits, if you want a windfall profit, the only windfall profits are the profits made by the big landowners, who are able to get huge amounts of money from the government, which means actually from the electricity consumer for having wind farms on their estates. Let's move on to something that, uh, we'll, we'll come back to the business side of it again, but the IPCC report, mm. it made global headlines. We are creating global warming, they said. The scientific proof is undeniable. Does that now negate the arguments you've been making for the last three years, or how do you see it? Well, first of all, there's nothing new. They've been saying that for ages. Uh, nothing new at all. I mean, the only new thing which they admit but in a rather sort of uh, uh, sotto voce way, they, they're not very happy with it, is that there has been no further recorded warming for the past 15 or more years, uh, which suggests, and scientists are increasingly coming to this conclusion, and they themselves half-heartedly admit it, uh, that uh, although uh, carbon dioxide emissions, which create carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, uh, have a have some kind of a warming effect. They probably have much less of a warming effect than they'd previously thought, uh, which is quite an important consideration because uh, if you are assessing what your policies should be, you need to form a judgment of as to what your policies are designed to guard against and obviously the great the less the extent of warming which they now largely can see the, uh, then the less drastic your policies need to be and the longer you can take in order to develop them because the slower you do it the more that there'll be technological development which will enable you to do things more efficiently that you need to do. So what's wrong with our current policy? What would you do if David Cameron rang you up now and said look Nigel I need some help what, what would your advice be? I would do two things. The first thing I would say is look what we do in this country uh, has a negligible effect on the amount of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. We account in this country now for less than 2% of global emissions. Uh, our total emissions are less than the increase in Chinese emissions in a single year. But that's no reason to do nothing, uh, is it? Which is, of course, because, because what it is is that the only way this policy makes sense is in the context of a global agreement. If all the major nations in the world are cutting back, otherwise it, it makes no sense. So the first thing I would do would be to amend the Climate Change Act to say it will be uh, in suspense. We will suspend it until such time as there's a global agreement. As you know, they've been trying to have a global agreement for ages, and the Kyoto Agreement was meant to lead to one, but they failed. Well, OK, let them ca carry on trying, which they say doing. But until such time as there is a global agreement, there is no point in our going out and in front alone and damaging our economy greatly as a result. That is does no good to anybody. And as I say, um, if uh, manufacturing, say, goes to China, I mean, they're, they're not a, we're not cutting global emissions in the slightest. It's just that the emissions are coming from China and not from the UK. But shouldn't we take a lead? Wouldn't that be, the critics would say to you, but we're supposed to be better than that. We're supposed to set the lead and create the change that other countries... Well, have. there's no point in setting a lead unless other people follow. Uh, and you remember from your history, 
the charge of the Light Brigade. That was setting a lead, but it wasn't a very sensible thing to do. There is no point in setting a lead unless other people are following, and other people are not going to follow. Uh, that's why there hasn't been a global agreement. The Chinese have made it clear they're not going to. India has made it clear it's not going to, and a number of other countries, but China and India are probably the two most important. Uh, and, but America's not doing it either. Uh, and that's pretty important as well. And the reason why then China and India are not doing it is because um, these are countries in development and happily uh, more successfully now than they have ever been before. But they want to keep this development going. And that means using the cheapest available source of energy. That's how you get economic development. That's how you get people out of poverty. That's how you prevent the destitution and malnutrition that still exists among hundreds of millions of people, unfortunately. And that is the, uh, the why they are not going to play ball on this. And indeed, I think it is morally repugnant of the West to try and persuade them to go from cheaper energy to more expensive energy and inhibit the economic development which can transform the lives of their people in their very large numbers. Should we not just nationalize our energy sector again? No, we had a nationalized energy secretary in the energy industry in the uh, until the 1980s and it was not good. It was it, it served the country I think very badly. Uh, we never of course had to any considerable extent the oil industry nationalized. And then we subsequently privatized the gas industry, we privatized the electricity industry, and these privatizations uh, improved the energy scene very considerably. So there is no case whatever for going back to state ownership. Let's finally fill up with, with business. If you say that we have the wrong bill, it's not an energy bill, it's a decarbonisation bill, what is the answer for business now? Uh, our business audience will be watching this. What is your message to them about how they can protect themselves when policy is driving up their prices more than anything else? I think they must make their voice felt. And they make their voice felt uh, in a measured way and point out to the government that there, there is a real risk uh, that, they, that many of them will be driven overseas. Because if they don't go overseas, there'll be overseas company would take their markets away from them. So uh, I think that they should make their voice felt far more effectively. I mean, some of them are doing it quite effectively now, but they need to make it, their voice felt even more effectively. So is the answer to scrap the energy bill we have now, and then go back to more uncertainty? I, it's not a question of more uncertainty, it's a question of going from a stupid policy to a sensible policy, going from a high cost energy policy, uh, whether it is the, the cost is paid for by the taxpayer or on the energy bills, a high cost energy policy to an efficient low cost energy policy. And we have a wonderful opportunity now because the, uh, the British Geological Survey suggests that we have the, probably the richest r resource of shale gas anywhere in Europe uh, and we need to get ahead developing that but if you are going to lock in to long-term contracts for wind particularly offshore wind which is the which is even worse than onshore wind uh, and long-term contracts for other uh, 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 non-carbon forms of energy then uh, we will not be able to take advantage of these shale gas resources which are sitting under the ground. It'll be a terrible waste and a terrible missed opportunity. So the policy has got to change. Policies can change, but it is very difficult when long-term contracts have been signed. But nevertheless, uh, if you make a mistake, the best thing is to correct it. Lord Lawson, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.